Hey, Conan O'Brien here. Welcome to Serious Jibber Jabber. I'm sitting here with Ken Burns, who is arguably the most accomplished historical documentary filmmaker of all time. His films have won dozens of major awards, including 12 Emmys, three Peabody's, and uh, he has single-handedly helped define our history as a nation. Pretty heavy introduction for you. That is heavy. Not bad. Not bad. And you're a welterweight champion. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm really thrilled to sit to sit down with you. I've been a fan for a long time. As you may have heard, I'm an amateur historian who makes his living in comedy. But this is what I like to read about. This is what I like to watch. I've seen all of your documentaries, and that brings us to the address. Yeah. Uh, I am a Lincoln fanatic, so I'm very happy to talk about the address, which is a fascinating idea for documentary. Why don't you tell people a little bit what it's about? I've lived for 35 years in a tiny village uh, in New Hampshire and across the Connecticut River in Putney, Vermont, is this tiny school called the Greenwood School. It's a boarding school for little boys, uh, ages 9, 10, 11, to all the way up to 16, 17, 18. And they all have dyslexia or ADHD, an alphabet soup of learning differences. And every late November when they come back from uh, Thanksgiving, they're asked to memorize and then publicly recite around Lincoln's uh, birthday, the Gettysburg Address. Now, this is a challenge for any of us, and we have, in fact, challenged the whole country to do this. Uh, but it's a minefield of terrors and anxieties for these kids. And I was asked as a neighbor uh, to be a judge one year. And a judge means give an award to everybody, and it's um, tears are streaming down my mm -hmm. cheeks when you see these kids sort of escape the specific gravity of the stuff that's held them back, that's gotten them bullied and marginalized in other schools, and this is the place of last resort. And I kept coming back, and I kept talking to them about the meaning of the Gettysburg Address, other stuff, been a judge again. And finally, I just thought, you know, cinema verite, which is the style, um, is not my style, but what am I waiting for? So it was the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, uh, was approaching in 2013, and I thought, let's just film this winter 2014, early 2013 attempt. And we embedded, shot 300 hours of these kids. They forgot we were there. Uh, we got to know and love them and the teachers, and it's a very close-knit, very funky place. And just watch the transformation of kids who have been told they were stupid and dumb all their lives, acquiring this thing, which they will always have for the rest of their lives, and uh, doing it magnificently. And then as a coda, we learned that the school in the 35 years of its existence, the 35 years of asking the kids to do this, had never been to Gettysburg. So I rented a bus, That's took the right. whole school, yeah. showed them, gave them a tour of Gettysburg, and then peeled off the kids one by one and had them recite. And it was three months later, they hadn't done anything on it, and they all still had it. It was all inside. It was something that they had internalized, something they'd kept. And it's not just rote memorization. They had also brought in the meaning of the words. And I think right. we, we don't do that anymore in the no. United States. We don't learn things. My dad had six hours of Shakespearean uh, passages and scenes and long poems and body dirty limericks and tons of stuff right on his hard drive. And, me less so, right. and and we don't teach anything because we said, oh, it's got to be relevant. There shouldn't be rote learning, and yet you see what we could do in unison. So we're now all independent free agents, mm -hmm. and we feel lonely, and we yearn for community. These kids, paradoxically, get some kind of agency, free agency, by doing this and liberate themselves, have a new birth of freedom. Lincoln says in the yep. Gettysburg Address. And yet, it's a free agency connected to community, to sharing their struggles with their teachers and their comrades, and going out and showing their families that they are somebody, showing their friends that they are somebody. It has an incredible existential thing. And then you realize the Gettysburg Address, the greatest speech ever given in the English language, is hovering over there. It's doubling down on the Declaration of Independence. It's it, the Declaration said all men are created equal, but oops, the guy who wrote it owned other human beings, right. which caused the war, which caused Lincoln to go to Gettysburg, the great site of the greatest battle, and to say this two minutes of doubling down on the Declaration. And that's been our operating manual since then. So I thought, just look at these kids, but see the context, you know, feel them in a way that you don't normally do, uh, and let them you know, work their way out of this tough, tough paper bag that they're in and excel. Who Now, someone had the idea uh, at some point to say, these kids should learn the Gettysburg Address. Yes. That's the stroke of genius to totally. me. 
is that uh, th because it's a speech that everybody talks about, and you've, everybody, there are New York, uh, maybe there have been more New Yorker cartoons about the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> exactly. But, tweet, but, tweet, is this yeah, mic on? Yeah. yeah, exactly. But then you don't know, uh, when was the last time someone read it and actually thought about it? Right. And uh, I revisited it recently. I was at an event, and I was supposed to give a speech the next day. Uh, you spoke the day before and recited the Gettysburg Address. And tried to put meaning into each word rather than the conventional wisdom that we think we know. I was furious because I had a speech to give the next day. The night before you give the greatest speech <laughs> <laughs> of all time. And yeah. I found myself looking down at mine thinking, it's no Gettysburg Address, but it's amazing when you sit and listen to it again, how powerful it is. And, and, and you know what, think about it. The guy who spoke before Edward Everett, the noted order of the day, gave a great speech at just under two hours. Two hours. Lincoln gets up, he speaks less than two minutes, 272 words if you accept the Bliss version. There are five different drafts of it. And he basically in the first sentence says, this is where we've been. In the second sentence says, this is where we are. And in the remaining eight sentences says, this is who we could be. This is what we're obligated to become. This is what we have to remember. This is what we have to do. And it is so poetic and mm -hmm. so meaningful. He uses the word here all the time. He, he places it like he rearranges the furniture. We, we here highly regard. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. You know, that we here highly resolve that these days. And it, it has a kind of hypnotic sense that you're listening clearly to political uh, speech, but there's a kind of enduring poetry to it I, I, that I don't know. I mean, I, I'm drawn to lots of speeches in history, and Lincoln's given a lot of them that are fantastic. Right, right. But this one, because of the concision, because this is at a place where they've just put nearly 10,000 bodies have died here and 56,000 casualties. It's the greatest battle ever fought on American soil. It is the defining moment of this civil war that had to happen because of the asterisk that the founders, right. Jefferson, left by saying all men are created equal, but we just mean white men of property free of debt, not anybody else. Right. And um, the fact that it has legs, the fact that on the first anniversary of 9-11, you know, we had that desperately sad recitation of the names of the dead. I mm -hmm. mean, just, just, you know, it's just like somebody hitting you with a sledgehammer right here. And v no contemporary speeches, just a few little words, one of which was the Gettysburg Address, has nothing to do with 9-11. But as I felt in the film is that words are medicine. You know, and it, particularly in our country, words do matter. Right. You know, we're formed with words. We're not formed because of geography or religion or conquest or economic. We're formed because we agree to subscribe to that de very deeply flawed catechism that is the Declaration. But Lincoln was the one who, who sort of made it uh, a new living. He breathed new life in it. Well, I think a lot of people forget that Civil War begins and it's a states' rights, uh, economic struggle. That's the way many people are, are seeing it. And Lincoln, it's at the Getty, you know, with the Gettysburg Address, and he also did it with the Emancipation Proclamation, he's single-handedly elevating- it Made it a higher cause. The so war, he's saying this is not just about you have cotton, but we have uh, yeah. steam power and more railways, and that he is making it about human rights, which you know, many people resent it. Many people thought that is not why we're fighting this so war. So this is a hugely important hugely important moment in American history because obviously this is the most important event. But for a long time leading up to, during, and, and particularly after, which is so sad, the descriptions of why the Civil War happened have been sort of political, states' rights, it's been economic, it's mm -hmm. been, you know, social. But when you boil it down, it has always been slavery. The social differences between a country based on slave labor or wage-based labor is different. The way you configure your, your towns, your plantations, your, right. the way you dance, the way you sing. Um, the uh, political stuff of states' rights, the South was just fearing that the North, 
uh, uh, would suddenly achieve with the addition of Western states a kind of majority, a super majority we'd say today, that would then prescribe things that, that they wouldn't like. And the one thing they feared was the abolition of slavery. And then they said, well, there are economic differences. But the only economic difference of significance was the fact the four million American citizens who were owned by other Americans. That was the most valuable property that the South had. And if you need to, to finally put a, a kind of an exclamation point on that and stop saying, stop talking about states' rights, stop talking about nullification, stop talking about interposition, stop talking about so, social stuff and things like that, go to South Carolina's Declaration of Secession in November, just after Lincoln's elected. It doesn't mention states' rights, but it mentions slavery several mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. That's why the war happened. But at the beginning, in order to keep the fragile coalition together, the border states, states yeah, and border western states. states and others within, you know, slaves that favored abolition and emancipation, he had to say this is a war for union. And as soon as he had even the semblance of a major victory, which took a long time to happen, not till September of 62 in the Battle of Antietam, which we look at as a draw, he nonetheless issued the Emancipation Proclamation mm -hmm. then on January 1st, 1863. And, and then six months later, you have this Battle of Gettysburg and four and a, and a half months after that, he has the opportunity to say a few appropriate remarks. He's not the featured part of this. All right, so this is the big question, uh, one of the big questions. He gives the Gettysburg Address. Uh, how does it go over? Now, is there any sense of how the crowd reacted uh, the speaker before him, Edward Everett, uh, almost two hours. Two hours. So and he's a much master. A remember, he's like a jazz guy. He'd he'd initiate a theme. He'd go off on a huge tangent. When yeah. he came back to the theme, people might even applaud just the virtuosity of his rhetorical skills. And he may have no notes in front of him. Yes, and so it's he is he's a headliner. Yeah, he's going out. He does two hours, uh, and it's verbal fireworks. Lincoln gets up. And uh, he has that, not the deep baritone that was portrayed throughout oh, all movies of all time. And forth. No. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's got the Daniel Day-Lewis sort of high reedy. Higher pitch, he's, it's reedy, exactly reedy is the right word. It's nasal, it's sort of Midwestern, it's got a little bit of twang in it. And it's been an effective tool all his life in the, in the hundreds, thousands of court cases he tried as a lawyer in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, in the Cooper Union speech. So it's, he's not without the awareness of his rhetorical powers. But you're right, he gets up and there's two minutes and people are sort of like, they're essentially settling in and he's done. He's done. And the photographer has taken his time to uh, focus and the only picture we have of Lincoln at Gettysburg is him back in his seat uh, on the dais. And so there's a kind of, uh, the Chicago papers, his state, Illinois, says the cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. Edward Everett writes him and says, you know, I hope that I could have come in two hours as close to the central theme of it as you did in two minutes, Mr. President, in a, in a great compliment. But the, the thing exists, not in a media culture where it's instantly YouTubeable or it repeated on C-SPAN right. four times, but it has to exist on a piece of paper, and there are five drafts, and it has to be in some ways promoted out by the newspapers that write about it, and some were very positive about it, by the commentary, word of mouth. And then also as time changes, as Lincoln's position in our pantheon changes, it grows with him. That's to the that point where we begin to go back to those words and the first inauguration, the better angels of our nature, and the message to Congress in 62, we cannot escape history, the fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation, the last best hope of earth, the second inaugural, malice towards none, charity. And all of a sudden you've got this body of work that, that seems to be pure presidential poetry that we're unaccustomed to. We've got good words, we've had them since and we had them before, but we didn't have them in this way and we didn't have them with a martyr in our most challenging moment. And you, all it, of that conspires to it make it. It does very much feel like you needed time. Time had to go by. I think so. Lincoln, I don't think uh, it wasn't possible in his own life that people could appreciate. He might have been the best writer of his time. He might have been the greatest intellect of his time and I know it's in your, in your uh, Civil War documentary that he was uh, considered, you know, 
by many one of two geniuses at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Shelby Foote thought Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederate cavalry yeah. uh, officer who later became horror of all horrors, the mm -hmm. first grand wizard of the right. Ku Klux Klan, but even quit to his partial credit uh, when the Klan became too violent. But uh, Shelby Foote's definition of genius, Lincoln is a genius. He wrote, someone said, with the bark on, the way Twain wrote too. He's, mm -hmm. he, wrote a, he wrote American. He was not... Uh, he was utterly American. He, he came out out of the soil so that we don't feel like he's trying to emulate as James Fenimore Cooper did, a kind of British literary tradition mocked magnificently by uh, uh, Mark Twain. Right. He's like Twain. He's just of the land. He's of the people. He's special to this continent. And so he's able to contain and reflect back to us uh, our wishes, you know, the best of ourselves. It's funny. He... Uh, was not, he didn't have the formal education. He didn't, and, and everything I've read about Lincoln said that he didn't even consider himself a great uh, wide reader with a great depth right. or breadth of knowledge. But he said, I know Shakespeare. Yeah. He said, I know, he, he read Shakespeare and he knew his King James Bible. He had the King James Bible, he had all of Shakespeare and he had the law. Yeah. And that, that, that's sort of a secondary thing, but I think it's really, we don't do him a service if we don't understand the way in which the law has a kind of beauty to it. Mm -hmm. We see it today, we see all of its flaws and its mistakes and its abuses and how it can be bought, but it also has a kind of purity to it that, that, and a logic to it. And if that law is issuing in a less, not less complicated time, but in less dense with the verbiage, it's also issuing from the Constitution and the laws of the state of Illinois in his case. And so there's logic, and so he's thinking through uh, with, with firm kind of rational one plus one equals two thinking, but he's got the King James Bible and Shakespeare, which are telling you always that one plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. It's this magic alchemy that you know, we, of course, reject in our brains, our everyday brains. Of course, one and one equals two, but of course, what we want in our life, in our comedy, in our sex, in our faith, in our art, in our literature, in our relationships, we want one and one to equal three. We want so the, the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts. And I think that he was able to take the logic of the law and apply it to what he was seeing politically, but then add the magistry and the poetry of the Bible and Shakespeare to give it, you know, purpose and a kind of immortality. I mean, we wouldn't be talking today right. if these 272 words didn't just have a kind of half-life that's almost endless. I can't imagine there, if there were human beings, we wouldn't still be talking sometime 10,000 years ago about the Gettysburg, time from now, about the Gettysburg Address. It's funny, it went viral before something could go viral. Exactly. He wrote, you know, it's, it's the essence of what we have today. Today we have the ability for everything to go everywhere. The challenge is finding anything that's worthwhile or that it can endure. He gives this one speech, two minutes long. There's no device there to record it. There's not even a good photograph that we can use. And there's five drafts that are slightly different. And over time, it gives you this kind of faith, I think, in a way that if you, if you use the words correctly, if you enunciate them, if you enunciate, if, if they're logical and if it's beautiful, that devoid of anything that would make something go viral, it becomes the greatest speech I agree of all time. You. And I think that's what you said. Faith is the key word. You know, we live in an age where there's so many pictures that they can't possibly be worth a thousand words anymore. Maybe they've been devalued to 250. Yeah. Uh, we live in an age where everything is covered so nothing has meaning. Yep. And so how is it that meaning survives? Where do we make meaning today out of our chaos? And, and you know, there's some real fundamental existential things that are going on, not with, just with these boys, but in this whole thing, and not just with war. It's just we spend our lives trying to pretend the fact that we're not, none of us are getting out of this alive. Mm -hmm. you know, and we try to keep the wolf from the door, but that wolf's always there. And we superimpose meaning over the chaos. We, we, we tell jokes, we tell stories, we put a frame around things. And that's a way of trying to create a narrative about stuff that has no narrative. And, and that's the chaos of life, and none of us get out alive. So when you find something that endures, it hangs on and it gives that meaning. I mean, how is it that somebody was born in 1809 for you and me, has 
tremendous, almost transcendent meaning as a human being who's been dead since 1865. That's an awfully long time ago. And we're, we're you know, in some ways captives of, of that genius still in, in a way that I wholly submit to. I'm willing to, to, to be part of that cult of, of Abraham Lincoln. So in this speech, Lincoln shows us, he wrote it, didn't have a, you know, was, did not use a speech writer. He wrote it in his own hand. He delivered it. it. And then we're left with this idea of what's happened to the speech. I think about this a lot. I think about, um, of, of course, you, cannot, you can't often tell in your own time what's a great speech. Right. It needs time. But clearly we've had fewer and fewer presidents, in my opinion, who seem to understand that a speech can change everything. Yes. Uh, John F. Kennedy was not president very long, and you can have a lot of historians line up and argue about the value of his policies. He didn't get to do much. He, he had a, a, a Congress that he, uh, that, that he couldn't convince to move. So he himself couldn't point to many accomplishments, but he's got- That first inaugural. That first inaugural, and it is fantastic, and it's the gift that keeps giving. That's right. And he knew, he and with the help of Ted Sorensen, he knew, I think because he was a fan of Churchill's. Yes. JFK used to listen yeah. to Churchill's speeches. He'd sit in the bathtub and listen to Churchill's speeches on, on phonograph records. He loved Churchill's speeches, and he understood this speech really counts. Yep. And the drama of it, and the meaning, and the symbolism, and the connection, the way Churchill did. Yeah, I agree, and and we don't know. I'm making a film, among many films, on the history of the war in Vietnam, and and we just don't know enough about what he would have done uh, with that. And so right. it's really part of the elevation of that speech comes from unexpressed potential, unrealized potential. Just like in Lincoln, yeah, Lincoln had already done so much, but it also the fact that it was cut short at his moment of triumph also elevates and makes us scrutinize in a different, perhaps more sympathetic way, what he did, in a way that you don't have with the other great speechwriters, of which we have been so fortunate um, in our country to have. We have, you know, it's, you, what you're saying, which I agree with, is that you have, it's two components. It's the speech, but then it's the, the speech alone can't do it. It also needs the situation. It needs the moment. It needs the moment. Lincoln had the moment and the speech. John F. Kennedy had a moment, a, a huge tra generational transition from Eisenhower to him. Born in this century, tempered by war. Yeah. This is, this is exactly right. He knew the cusp that he was on, but the moment was created retroactively. That is right. to say, the moment of his death moved yes. back to the moment of the speech, and they coexist because the speech has great rhetorical beauty to it, but it's made all that more important by the fact of his death, just as Lincoln's, not so much his death, but the moment of the greatest battle ever fought on American right. soil. And there's, I think about Churchill, 1940, it really looks like uh, 39, uh, th uh, that it seems a foregone conclusion. The Nazis are coming, they've defeated France. We almost don't really have we got what we could out of Dunkirk, but we don't have, how are we gonna, be, how are we gonna beat this massive, omnipotent machine? The Russians are siding with them. It's almost over, and Churchill gives that speech. He, now he, there's the moment and the speech. And he draws a line in the sand. Yeah. I mean, that's the ultimate one, and he stood by it. He says, we will fight them on the, the beaches, beaches. Yeah, yeah, and we will fight them in the hills, and, we'll fight, and, and that speech, people before had no hope, and many people talk about, yeah. a lot of people who are still alive say, and then after he gave that speech, I thought, screw him. Screw them all, we're gonna fight. I've been working on a uh, series and just finished, it'll be out in the fall of 2014 on the Roosevelt's, Theodore Franklin and Eleanor. We've put them all together and TR's got some great speeches and FDR of course has the famous inaugural, that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Mm -hmm. But a few days later he goes and gives his first uh, fireside chat that's less than 15 minutes long. 
He explains the banking system to everybody. And at that point, there had been runs on bank. Thousands of banks have already failed. And people have, there have been run on the banks. They've declared a bank, not a moratorium, as Hoover called it, but a bank holiday, which is a more pleasant thing. Right. And he just says, hoarding has become uh, an unfashionable pastime. And put your money back in the banks. And on the, when the banks reopened, that's exactly what Americans did. And, and you know, essentially, talk about urgency of moment. He, capitalism, as some wag, some aide said, was saved in eight days. I mean, yeah. just yeah. by virtue of the power of words, people listened to them and said, that's right, I will, I understand what it means. It was sort of like Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life. You know, yeah. my, that money's in your house. Your and money's, money's not there. Yeah, yeah, it's, well, yeah, exactly. And, and, and uh, we, we, you know, that's, a, that's an FDR New Deal riff. Yeah. And that comes from his ability to personalize it and say, you know, my life is tied up in yours. And he says that, you know, this is as much your problem as it is my problem, my friend. Yeah. And they, they believe that when he died and his, and his uh, funeral procession was going down Pennsylvania Avenue, some man just collapsed, just wailing. And, and the person next to him stood him up and, and, and said, did you know the president? And he said, no, but he knew me. Wow. And I thought that was the example in which rhetoric somehow pierces all of the armor of our political system and then the armor that we ourselves as individuals construct to guard us from those complicated and nuanced feeling. Franklin Roosevelt also had that gift. You could not, if you wanted, if you hired an actor who had a calm, reassuring voice, you couldn't do better than Franklin Roosevelt at that time. George Will said, the greatest New Deal program was Franklin Roosevelt's smile. He was incapable of depression, and we were in a depression, Will says, and, and that's a really good way of understanding it. He had been armored, he goes on to say, with sort of Christian faith that American history was a rising road and this utterly free sense of experimentation. And so you were in the hands of somebody who sh displayed not a flash of doubt. And even if something went wrong, you said, okay, we'll, tr we'll try something else. And now we're yeah. also, we're navel gazers, we're all introspective, we've got a huge media apparatus Radis, that sort of churns out conventional wisdom by the yard of every stripe. And there's very little room to actually tolerate movement for anybody, left, right, or center, in a, in a real political dynamic. And so we say, well, why can't we get things done the way they used to? Well, these things passed by one vote or didn't pass, or the Supreme right. Court ruled them unconstitutional. But it really becomes a question as we debate what the role of government is and what a citizen can expect of the government, which is the age-old American political question. It's also what is the nature of leadership and what is character about? Where does character and leadership intersect? And how does someone escape the specific gravity of their own flaws? Teddy Roosevelt's feebleness as a child, the early tragedies that he had, Eleanor Roosevelt's insecurity, Franklin Roosevelt's infantile paralysis, and sort of kind of glibness. I mean, he's almost sort of, you know, I, I deserve this. And then all of a sudden he's tempered um, by this extraordinary event, infantile paralysis at 39. And so mm -hmm. how, we like to think in this modern age that heroes ought to be perfect. And if anything goes wrong, you go, aha, see, it's not like the old days. But if you go back to the Greeks, they never said that heroism was about perfection. They said that heroism was someone with some very obvious strengths and some maybe not so obvious and perhaps equal weaknesses. And it is the negotiation and sometimes the war between those strengths and weaknesses that actually define heroism. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, if you let in that fresh air of human reality, because I haven't met a perfect person, um, you you're suddenly have her heroes all around you because of the complicated dynamics they're involved in and our relationship to them. And it, it makes you, history makes you, these words make you more sanguine, more hopeful, more full of faith. And that goes back to what you're saying. It is about faith. It is, uh, I think what makes the Caro books on Lyndon Johnson so compelling is how titanically gifted he is and how titanically flawed he is. It's that swirly cone of vanilla and chocolate together and they're completely intertwined. And inseparable yeah. once the swirly cone has come out because you can't separate Lyndon Johnson from his flaws. And this is what we, try to do. We're so 
dialectically preoccupied. Everything's red or state or blue state, it's gay or straight, it's young or old, it's rich or poor, it's east or west, whatever it is we like to say, male or female, we know the distinctions right. between us. But in fact, we find our own existence so filled with shades of gray that this attempt to try to put everything in a black and white corner just never works. And, and the great mastery of Caro's book and what makes Lyndon Johnson one of the most compelling figures, or say Richard Nixon too. So I, was, I was just thinking about Richard know, Nixon. I mean, here's the guy who starts the Environmental Protection Agency, right. uh, you know, opens up China. Opens the door to China. But he's a yeah. red baiter, you know, he get his whole political career is based on destroying people because they're not, they're too soft on communism. And then who is the guy who opens up relationships? I mean, if he had not won that election, and Humphrey, who probably wouldn't have thought of this, though it would have been within his DNA, it, it, who would have been the loudest critic? It would have been Richard Nixon. Right. And we would have looked to him for saying, you know, don't you disagree with this? And you begin to see the way in which uh, the partisanness of politics is, does such a disservice. It's a necessary part of it. But when you see it within some person, the wars within him, within them over well, these we know laws, too much. We know too much now, too, because you look at you know, with Nixon, every time the dust starts to settle and people start to say, you know. He did the, do this. He did do this and he did do that. They release more tapes. Exactly. More tapes come out. And, and he's like a dagger in the It's heart. a dagger and there's, you know, there's anti-Semitism and there's pettiness and smallness. And I think uh, the words devoid of God knows what any of these people said right. in the privacy of, of their own uh, Oval Office or their own of home. Course. And, uh, but now we just have the words, which are beautiful. You know, but my, what I'm curious about, and I'd love to get your opinion, is I get despondent sometimes because I don't remember, I cannot think of an inaugural address that I've really liked. I can't think of a State of the Union address that has moved me because I feel that they've become uh, containers for if it's the Republican Party, it's you've got to throw the RNC their red meat. If it's the Democratic Party, you've got to announce all these all this policy. You've got to touch every base, which doesn't make for a great speech. I, I usually find they're overly long, and I usually find them to be doled out, please applaud segments that I don't find inspirational. They don't. They're not elevated. Now I know that I'm I'm holding them to a high standard. Well, I, I think it is partly that because. It's, we live in an age in which, the tier, particularly in the United States of America, where the tyranny of choice has a huge sway over us. We, we've got so much commentary about stuff, so many different things that we have. Remember Moscow on the Hudson, mm -hmm. where uh, it opens up when Robin Williams is a struggling musician in Moscow, and he's waiting in line for hours for he knows or not what, only to discover in, that there's nothing there left, whatever it was that he was waiting in line for. That's the tyranny of no choice. Right. He comes to the United States, he defects, he you know goes to some supermarket in the Upper East Side and tries to buy a coffee and a guy says aisle four and he turns around and there are 200 choices of coffee and he faints dead away, right. which is the tyranny of choice. I think in some ways it's really hard to get at these speeches now because they are so filtered by the political expediency that has to be you know, doled out, as you say, left, right, and center, but also because we have so much filters uh, as we watch them. And we don't know what's being said in other places. That's why C-SPAN's so great to, to watch is because you can actually see stuff raw and every once in a while go, wow, I don't think I've ever heard anyone great. say that's why C-SPAN is so great I, to watch. I just think, I, I, I sometimes yeah. find myself, you suddenly turn and you know everybody just goes past it. But if you stop every once in a while, you're seeing somebody, maybe they're at some uh, think tank or maybe it is on the floor of Congress or it's a right. hearing or it's at you know some presidential library and there's somebody talking about it and you go, Wow, stuff is actually happening. The the you know things are being moved along. And it's not being chopped up into yeah. sound bites. Yeah. I mean that's. I, what I would submit you know going back that Barack Obama's given some great speeches. George W. Bush you know gave two speeches in a row in front of a joint session of Congress and the National Cathedral right after 9/11 that we all needed. We really need it, and I guess there's no words that come out of it that are as memorable as, say, Jack Kennedy's uh, inauguration or other things. Uh, Ronald Reagan gave some speeches. You have Kennedy's speech. There are four or five. I, uh, there were moments, I think, uh, Ronald Reagan after the challenger. After the challenger, when he was that, uh, what do they say, the consoler in chief, you know? Yeah. And, and if you look at the speech that um, 
Barack Obama gave in Tucson after the Gabby shooting. Giffords. Gabby Giffords. Gabby Giffords thing. I, I, I've and, thought about that recently because that was a moment where people needed. Yeah. And and the, it's interesting. The president comes in. It's a it's it's. We don't actively elect a president to console us at moments, but that turns out is one of the most important parts of the job. It is, it is the part of leadership, which we understood even at the beginning that the role of the president was going to be not just one of three branches and the sort of decider of the executive branch side of things, but it was going to have a kind of symbolic investment that would not be royal, though we try our best to turn it into that but that it would then have other responsibilities. You know? And I think the, there are great pitfalls in that because we think everything will succumb to uh, personality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you have the president, and remember he spoke after three or four of his own cabinet members, uh, all of whom invoke scripture, uh, this is the godless Democratic Party, and right. then the president came with three or four lightning bolts of both Old and New Testament mm -hmm. that were stunning for their appropriateness to the tragedy, but also making the tragedy secondary. And he's asking us all to, be, to make a country that's worthy of the little girl who went to visit her congresswoman mm -hmm. at the mall and got murdered mm -hmm. for her civic engagement. And it's one of the most moving speeches ever. And so I think maybe what you're talking about is this garden doesn't look as pretty as I thought it did in the 18th century, but what it needs is just some weeding. You need to, yeah. like, there's, there are too many well, weeds in the way. You know, what I get back to also is brevity. Lincoln was a master of brevity, and it's lean. If you just look at it as prose or poetry, because it is poetry. That's right. And when actually, when he tried to write poetry, it wasn't good poetry. <laughs> he was, true, he was a bad true. poet, but <laughs> when he wrote speeches, they were poetic and yeah. beautiful. Yeah. But they're lean. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats. Yeah. They could be very- Completely lean. That's completely less than 15 lean. minutes where he explained the entire banking system and got everybody to do the exact opposite of what they thought they were gonna do on right. Monday. And you look at Lend-Lease with Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. He's, he desperately, we, he wants to help England. He wants to give them ships. Nobody in America wants to get involved. And he comes up with, he says, well, you know, what we're gonna do is, our neighbor's house is on fire, we're gonna let them borrow our, yeah. our garden hose. Yeah. We're just gonna let them borrow it. What's it, it? It's an analogy that's beautiful, but it's completely misleading. It falls completely apart when you're giving them material of war. Yeah, material of war. Because I'm returning this empty shell casing, I'm yeah. returning this destroyed tank. It doesn't, it doesn't work, but it worked beautifully. It worked. What I think we get away from now is, uh, I'm yearning for a president or a major policymaker to get up at an event and uh, say something with great brevity that has power. Yes. And I almost feel like we're in an age now where that's been lost. And it's easy to say, oh, the olden days were better. I understand that, but. Isn't that interesting though, because we're in a place where we also bemoan the fact that everything's been reduced to a two or three minute YouTube kitten thing, right? And um, and and we th and we yearn for. We know in our lives that all real meaning accrues in duration. That the relationships you're proudest of, the work you care the most about, is the work that has benefited from your sustained attention. Mm -hmm. And so we live in a world where everything's interrupted by commercials, or we have an attention span that's supposed to be that. But we. We, we yearn for some duration, you know. We say our kids, they, they're going to hell in a handbasket, but they line up at midnight to buy a Harry Potter book that's gonna take them 24 hours to mm -hmm. read, mm -hmm. of sustained reading. So we both want that brevity, we have it in front of us, and yet we don't have it in the way we want it. Somebody who could, like Abraham Lincoln, distill the entire essence of what was going on. I mean, you can go back to Jefferson, however flawed that second sentence of the Declaration is, and say, he distilled a century of enlightenment thinking into one sentence, and he didn't follow John Lyock and say life, liberty, and property. He said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was a capital H happiness. He did not mean the pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things. He meant lifelong learning in a marketplace of ideas, that if, mm -hmm. you, if you liberated people by allowing them to govern themselves, they would grow 
spiritually, that human evolution would occur in a mental and spiritual and emotional plane. And our founders talked about higher emotions, not the base emotions of sentimentality and nostalgia, and not, I would suggest, just living in the rational world, the safety of the rational world, where one and one is uh, always two, but in some higher emotional realm in which you can risk the blessing, risk the blessing of one and one equaling three. And this is a great testament to one sentence. You know, and you could make an argument. We made a film on Jefferson, and a person in the film made an argument that he's the man of the millennium, meaning from 1,000 to 2,000. And really? this is a guy, mm -hmm. and we can go also about what our media culture does. He's on Mount Rushmore, but slept with the teenage girl he owned. Mm -hmm. Oops. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, a um, uh, depressive, uh, very much into things of the spirit and spiritualism that would mm -hmm. make Ronnie Reagan and Nancy Reagan's uh, consulting of horoscopes, uh, you know, sort of minor. Uh, you have Franklin Roosevelt, a cripple, you know, wouldn't get out of Iowa today. Uh, a media that would be not turning a blind eye to Jack Kennedy's uh, extramarital affairs, but in fact uh, staking them out like uh, Francois Hollande, and thank goodness he wouldn't be arriving on a little mini bike, but you know, you wonder who would be selected out by our media culture today. I, I, I think we'd probably lose, Warren G. Harding would always get elected. He looked like a president. He looked fantastic. Yeah. So, but Warren, <laughs> Warren, Warren Harding, who <laughs> always, when I think about presidents, I think, okay, I think Warren Harding is always my vote for my least favorite. Yeah. And I don't want to answer letters now from the Harding. The Harding said, well, he's, there are some folks who have been re trying to rehabilitate him. Uh, you're they can't, safe, he can't be rehabilitated. You're safe with uh, James Buchanan, the yep. 15th president, and the two before him, Pierce and, uh, and uh, Fillmore. Because they're the do-nothing presidents at a time when we Needed have someone. a civil war to avoid. Or maybe we just say the civil war was inevitable and we need to get to Abraham Lincoln and figure out how through get, a crucible like that. You know, before the civil war, when speaking about our country, we said the United States are plural. We mm -hmm. saw ourselves as a collection of things. After the civil war, we began to use the word nation, which is a one thing. And we say today the United States is. That's ungrammatical. That's ungrammatical. These people is a really good, good group of people you work with. Right, no. That's not wrong. These states is, no. The United States is the greatest country on earth. That was what Lincoln was able to do by holding that thing together for that long, by making it the higher cause. He made us a one thing, and we say it to this day, and it's ungrammatical. That's, you, that's the magic, I think, of history. You got everybody uh, to, you reached out to a lot of people in the public eye, and has this all recite yeah. the Gettysburg Address. You had me do it. I was amazed, because I've read it many times. I've amazed. said it out loud, but I said it, we did it uh, here after a taping. After a show, I was gonna After a show, and I'm sitting uh, at my desk and ready to do it, and I said, okay, we need to do this now, and went through it, and the power of the whole room, I mean, it changed. Every, there are people in this room who were there. Everybody got very quiet. You could hear a, a, a needle drop, and it is incredible. And I'm sure you've seen it. it you cannot read. And what I liked is that you got all kinds of different people we, we, to we read did, it. We did a mashup. You know, if you go to learntheaddress.org, I mean, our, our idea was as we were watching these boys struggle, we said, boy, if they can do it, we can do it. Right. So we all challenged ourselves. And then we said, why don't we challenge all school kids? And we said, why don't we challenge everybody to, to do this? And so I reached out to all the living presidents. They instantaneously said yes and did it. Mm -hmm. and, and we did a mashup with them, but it also had Bill O'Reilly and Rachel Maddow. It had you and Steven Spielberg and um, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates. It had Uma Thurman and Taylor Swift and Robin Roberts. It had, you know, all this whole melange of people. And then if you continue on that site, you got everybody doing their entire one. And all of a sudden, thousands of other Americans have added theirs. Sometimes it's a class in Alabama or Hawaii or Utah. Sometimes it's a 100-year-old person or a 90-year-old person or a little kid. It's a father and daughter who've gone to Gettysburg and they've, as a project together, have done it. And now we're just introducing it to the PBS system and they're gonna ask all of their local areas, the, the government, uh, the governors, the legislatures, the school districts, the churches, to, to reach out. What if we did actually something that was bottom-up 
not top down, that was bottom up, that we did together, that we could all share it, and you could suddenly realize what could possibly unite Bill O'Reilly and Rachel Maddow but the Gettysburg Address. Right. I mean, I started a, a nonprofit called the Better Angels Society. It's after Lincoln's first inaugural when he's appealing mm -hmm. to the better angels of our nature. And the idea is, who doesn't like Abraham Lincoln? I mean, you've got to be really fringe left or right not to like Abraham Lincoln. So that means history is a table around which we can still have a conversation, a civil conversation, a civil discourse. And then maybe stuff happens. And because, as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun, um, human nature remains the same. And you can use these historical examples to help now. You know, you know, you know what's incredible is in my own personal experience has been for 20 years I've had an hour a night and I t try and entertain people. Every now and then, and it's very rare, I get an opportunity to give a speech. And when I do, I work really hard on it. And one or two times I have found that it actually has more, it can have a more sustained dramatic impact over time yes. than a couple thousand hours of television. There's something about giving a speech, and you'd think, it's counterintuitive, because you'd think in an era of Twitter, and noise, and technology, and lights, and CGI, and IMAX, you'd think that the speech would be completely displaced. It's but, not. you know. I was present at one of those speeches that you gave. Um, however daunted you were, perhaps, by my reading of the two minutes. <laughs> yeah, the night, night before, before, yeah, yeah. I thought it was one of the finest speeches I'd ever heard there, and everyone who heard it spoke about it for days. I went up to you afterwards and mm -hmm. I said, that was about as good a speech as I've heard, because it was so honest and so direct and so from the heart, and it was sustained. It was a half an hour right. of, of, your, of who you were, and you gave the great gift of who you were to everyone else, and at the same time brought in it an understanding of modern media culture, what the internet is doing, how it affects you, what 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 your own but isn't experience it, has been. But isn't been. it strange, isn't it, you know, what I, what I never ceases to amaze me is that it's such, it's as old as Aristotle yep. or older, but there's this, there's still this thing where someone's going to get up and give a speech, and it's sacred, yep. it's still sacred, and if it goes well, it, it's like a pebble in the water. It, the, the rings just seem to emanate out from it. And it's this, it's this thing where you think, oh, there's, there is something to this speech given yeah. that is absolutely remarkable. And now it feels like we need it more than ever, or we need it at least as much as we've ever needed it. It's we need true. people to get up and talk and uh, I give speeches and it's not my day job. You gave a speech, that's not your day job. You do have speaking as part of what right, you do, right. but, but we need that glue. We need to be connected to one another. We need to recognize in the other, that's it. We just need to recognize each other. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't happen. You know, comedy is a hugely important force in our lives because um, you know, Mark Twain said, uh, the source of laughter is not joy but sorrow. There is no laughter in heaven. That, that humor hits the yes and no of the same thing at the same time. It's that, how is that possible? And we laugh at it. And what we do is we reassure ourselves. And in that reassurance, there's recognition and connection. And that's what we seek in that sort of thing. And you do start off with a joke. Yeah. And, and speakers start off with jokes in order to say, you know, um, or some trope that's different. You know, the one we're talking about, he says four score and seven years ago, and we think this is some manifestation of the anachronistic. It's not. Nobody spoke that way. He was just trying to find a new way of saying 87 years isn't really that long, ladies and gentlemen, that we've been at this thing, and look where we are, and we can do better. So he's riveting their attention. He's getting their attention by saying four score and seven years ago, and all of a sudden everybody's doing the math. A score is 20 times four, that's 80 plus seven. Four score and seven, 87 years ago, yeah. that's 1776. This is 1863. You know, he had, he had them Yeah. right there. It's, uh, there's something about, obviously we have our MSNBC and our Fox. We have our, you know, um, there's left-leaning, there's right-leaning, and it's become professional wrestling. Right. And it's been perfected to the point 
where people intentionally don't want to understand each other. Of course not. Because there's no money in that. There's no there's money. There's no money in, uh, in, and it's on both sides. Of Actually, course there is. is no money in people saying, you know, nuance. Let's look at the nuance in between. There is no money in it, and so I think people have a, a common sense speech that would bring everybody together would actually have to be denied by both sides. By the pundits, and, and that's exactly what happens, and so that's where we feel this kind of free fall, this abyss that we're in. That is to say, you might recognize something. Um, you know, I'm working on this film on Vietnam, and it's very interesting that even people who, perhaps back in the 60s and early 70s, felt a certain way about Vietnam, because of whatever their political orientation is now, they have to feel a certain way about Vietnam that's different. And, it, and they don't know anything about it, in fact, we know so little about what took place that we didn't even know who was ruling Vietnam at the time. We thought Ho Chi Minh and General Giap, we said, whose name was Zop, and, and they weren't. There was another guy that we learned only through recent scholarship who was really sort of happening, running the country, the North Vietnam. So we talk about it, but we don't have any idea what we're talking about. Right. And, and when you have a chance to say something in a speech or a film or of something of length or duration or brevity, whatever it is, you you're still gonna attract the people who say, uh-uh, because -uh, he's clearly this, or he's clearly that. Oh, he's clearly a lefty. Oh, he's a conservative. How could he, you know? And you can just sit there and smile. And I think the good thing is, is that most of the country uh, has a really good smell test, you know? Yeah. They, they just look and go, I'm not buying that. That was always the bet. You know, that was the bet in 1775, and it's still the bet that yeah. American people will figure it out. They won't, they won't get it right all the time. And they don't get it right, and we, and we are in danger. You know, we, you know, you go out on the street and you ask somebody how many senators there are, and they have no idea. Who are your two senators? No idea. Who's your representative? No idea. How many branches of government? I don't know. Forty percent of graduating high school seniors think we fought with the Germans against the Russians in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. A majority of high school seniors can't tell you the correct half century in which the Civil War took place. They, don't, they can't put in chronological order and tell the significance of the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, and the Bill of Rights. I mean, we've got, uh, we live in a, in, a, in a kind of consumer culture in, an, in a sort of completely disposable present where if you just buy, you can buy your happiness. But of course, the inevitable vicissitudes are going to visit all of us. And what are you going to fall back on? Yeah. And, and, and I think what happens if you have an uninformed electorate or an increasingly uninformed electorate it's easier for the propagandists to say what they want to say. The United States government is an evil force. Well, you know, in fact, the United States government, for all its screw-ups over time, has done some pretty great things, starting with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights through Man on the Moon and GI Bill and interstate highway system and social security and national parks and land-grant colleges and homestead acts and transcontinental railroads. This is not such a bad thing. We've done a lot of good, uh, uh, terrible things, and I've tried in my film to show them, but to a priori say government is and of itself bad means that you wake up in any election cycle having to disprove an, a negative, mm -hmm. and that's a tough place to be in. And, and, and there are people who benefit from the largesse of this government who are anti-government. Oh, yeah. Oh no! You know who it's, wake it, up on January first with you know eighty thousand dollars or eight hundred thousand dollars or eight million dollars not to plant something, and they're complaining about some mother who's put her thumb on the scale because she said she has two kids and she only has one to get the extra six dollars and fifty cents uh, a month for for the welfare thing, and so we're in that divided territory, forgetting we're all benefits benefiting from the largesse of this government in some way. Or well, I think sometimes the, uh, a lot of the discourse is just people wanting to belong yeah. on both sides. Uh, yeah, of course. The, there are people that, uh, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family and I was always confronted by people who, who uh, were wearing the fact that they were Irish on their sleeve. Mm -hmm. Now, if you'd actually say to them, do, what do you know about Ireland? Do you know anything about your family? They didn't know anything. Right. They wanted to wear a they wanted to wear a tweed hat. Yep. They wanted to drink Guinness. They wanted to talk about how the Irish were the best goddamn people in the world and slap your heart on the back. 
And it was about that thin. And have and, their black moods and have their, yeah. you know, all of that. And then I realized at a certain point, oh, you know, a lot of these people at this St. Patrick's Day Parade, in Boston, there's a lot of people here that just want to belong. That's it. That's and exactly that, that's where you get the same thing of- You're uh, so smart. I, you know, that is exactly I'm it. Fox News or I'm MSNBC. That's who I am. It's a, it's an emblem. It's a it's it's the yeah. insignia. It's the colors of your team. You it's know? the Crips and the Bloods. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and and they're going to battle it out. So you have we have to look for some sort of. And it's not centrist. The mistake is to think it's centrist. The, the center is important, but it is the place in which you can have a conversation and you can compromise. Yeah. That's the essence of it. I mean, the Civil War happened because compromise broke down. People yeah. were uncompromising, and so we murdered each other, and um, you don't want to see that happen again. We have a question from the internet. Patrick from Facebook asks, have you ever considered a documentary on the history of comedy? I have, actually, many, many times. Um, and there have been people who have worked in public television doing uh, things like that. There was a series called Make Em Laugh a few years ago by a really good filmmaker named Michael Cantor. Uh, that's nice, of course. Um, at the same time, I want to tell stories. And so I would submit that even in the darkest films that I've made, there's always humor. There's always room to permit humor to take place. You know, in the middle of the Civil War, um, you know, uh, we, we started writing about some of the stuff. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, if he ever saw a man uglier than himself, he'd shoot the wretch and put him out of his misery. Yeah. U.S. Grant said he knew only two tunes. One was Yankee Doodle, and the other wasn't. And the other wasn't, yeah. You know, um, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman hated newspaper men so much, he said that if I killed them all, there'd be news from hell before breakfast. And no, there's the, the Civil War documentary uh, uh, is, I was always impressed. It's packed with really funny it has moments. And it's, and uh, just the incredible irony of so much of it. And the, and the generals, the Northern generals are comical in yeah, their the, ineptitude. The, the rotation of idiots that takes yeah. place there from McDowell and McClellan and, and Burnside who said his dispatches back to Lincoln, you know, headquarters in the saddle. And Lincoln said he had his headquarters where his hindquarters ought to be. And I mean, just uh, there. Who's the general? Was it Burnside? There's one, one of my favorite quotes of Lincoln's is if he, uh, a general lost his nerve in a battle. And I'm wondering, I can't remember if it's Burnside or not, It's but uh, Lincoln said he behaved like a duck that had been hit over the head. Yeah, yeah. and I thought that is Hooker, Hooker. Yeah, in, it was Hooker in, in the Peninsula campaign. Yeah, but I, I, I've thought about. I could say I could have said that tonight yeah. on the air. Yeah, I could have said that is a joke from 1862 yeah. that is still works works today. I could say what's wrong. Andy could say what's wrong with that guy. I could say I don't know. He's acting like a you know you hit a duck over the head. Yeah, a, a duck that was hit over the head, and it's a, such a funny. Pure Instantaneous image. thing, yeah. you know, uh, when McClellan was asking for more and more troops, Lincoln said sending him troops was like shoveling fleas across a barnyard. Yeah. And it's instantaneously an image, and the greatest one-liner I thought of the 19th century comes from Twain. He said, it's not that the world is filled with fools, it's just that lightning isn't distributed right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, yeah. if you think about other 19th century humorists, and there are several, you know, they're not funny anymore. They're topical Twain in the is, moment. Twain, but is, Twain still is funny. Always funny and still funny. And you know, he said the difference between the right word and mm -hmm. almost the right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. And that's not funny. It's just really true. And he never wrote a bad sentence. And so you can you can pick up Twain anywhere, Innocence Abroad, you know, uh, you know, obviously Huckleberry Finn, but yeah. but the the prose things, uh, roughing it. Uh, and a life on the Mississippi and just start reading and come across some of the most beautifully constructed things. And he, like Lincoln, wrote with the bark on. That is yeah. to say, sounded American. Didn't felt like there was artifice that you had to pretty it up or, or you know, do something. He was just who he was. He was also maybe our first stand-up comic. Oh, oh, without a doubt. He once said, he once did this thing where he, I don't remember where it was, but he was on this long tour. And, and people loved him already from the books and from how his humor and, and the humor in the books and the humor in his stand-up stuff. And he'd go and he just went out in front of an audience and decided just to test it. And he didn't say anything. And he didn't say anything. And he didn't say anything. Somebody started to laugh. Another person started to laugh. And he still wouldn't say anything. And all of a sudden, the whole place was just going crazy with laughter. And he just said, I did it. Yeah. You know, I had him. It was like in Worcester or something like that. 
I know Worcester. <laughs> my, people you, are, you, my people are from Worcester. You played Worcester. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't work in Worcester now. Um, this has been an absolute thrill. This has been great. I, I, and I'm really looking forward to the, uh, the Franklin and Teddy and Eleanor Roosevelt series. When is that going to be out? Uh, it's taking over an entire week of primetime PBS starting September 14th. It's the first time that's ever happened, Sunday through Saturday. The seven episodes, each two hours, but they'll repeat each episode twice. Did anyone, of, of the three of them, did, it, did anyone surprise you the most between uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Eleanor, you, and Franklin? You know, they all surprised me because in one way or another they they exploded what my preconception was. Yeah. Um, Theodore Roosevelt turned out to be much more unstable but so lovably so that, that I hadn't understood that. Um, the Eleanor turned out to be with the exception of prohibition and you could understand it because her father was alcoholic and she was sent as mm -hmm. an orphan to be with alcoholic uncles and her, her younger brother who she felt responsible for died of alcoholism. She was for prohibition but she was right on everything else, everything else, every issue. She was right and usually ahead way, of time. Way ahead of her time. Way ahead of the time. To the, much to the irritation of her husband. And yeah. as a Lincoln guy who puts Lincoln at the very top, Franklin Roosevelt rose up in parody to him, and I never thought I would say that really? in my life. I never thought, you know, he handled the two greatest crises since the Civil War, which was our greatest crises, but it's not about that. It's about all of the things, the crucible of, of polio, the ability to lead, uh, the, the, the sheer willpower. I mean, if you look at the oldest picture you can think of Teddy Roosevelt, he died at age 60. Mm -hmm. I'm 60. He looked like he was 85. Yeah. Franklin Roosevelt died at 63. He looked like he was a cadaver, like he was yeah. 95. And they just gave their lives for this country. And if you think of getting through the Depression and the Second World War, and the kind of world we live in now, for better and for worse, uh, that Franklin Roosevelt delivered, following on the work of his fifth cousin Theodore, that is to say a progressive activist, big government ag uh, agenda, one as a Republican, ironically, and one as a Democrat. This is the world we live in and no other family has had a greater effect on more Americans than the Roosevelt period, full stop, I'll defend that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I can't wait I just, for you to see uh, it. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna camp out yeah. outside your home <laughs> until it's ready to go. <laughs> I have read, I have read so much about, uh, and, and in recent years more about Theodore Roosevelt, and yeah. just a ton about Theodore Roosevelt, and my theory is that he was manic. I have a theory that he was. Everybody in that side of the family, that's where the, most of the alcoholism and madness and all of that came from. And what he experienced, he was manic as was Eleanor. They had to keep moving. And when his wife and mother died on the same day in the same yeah. house, February 14th in the 1884, I think it was. And that he, dark day in his, in his he diary. Just, he writes an X on it. Yeah. He goes out to the Badlands and he says this great 19th century line. He says, black care, capital B, capital C, can rarely catch up to a rider whose pace is fast enough, meaning you can outrun your demons. Yeah. And so what he and Eleanor did all their lives was to escape the specific gravity of the hellhounds that, of madness, of alcoholism, of excess that are always on their heels, and they do a damn good job of it. Franklin comes from a much sort of saner side of the family, the Hudson River branch, but he's then stricken you know, as this optimistic kid who's been loved better Big, than handsome, anybody else. tall. Handsome, live, great golfer, the runner, yeah. everything. And all of a sudden, he can't outrun his demons. So the kind of transformation that I believe took place within the soul of Franklin Roosevelt is one of the most amazing things. And it doesn't matter what your politics are. Because when you see leadership at that level, of that caliber, you, you can only think of one other name in American history. Well, two, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, but w what you're essentially saying, which is something that I agree with 100%, which is that um, people that are outrunning darkness, we come from this era where people say, you need to, you're, um, you're in denial. Right. <laughs> you need to kind of, that's the favorite phrase of the last 20, 30 years, is you're in denial. And um, my father once said to me, you know, denial's done some pretty amazing things. It has done, and Theodore and it, Roosevelt is exactly that. And it's, you look at, the, you know, the Roosevelt people, and maybe many of the great people, look at Lincoln, Lincoln, all the tragedies he suffered and the poverty. 
that denial yeah. can accomplish amazing things. I, I agree. And, and I, if think I, should, I think we should end on that note, which is to tell all young people, denial. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Denial, denial, denial. denial. <laughs> Ken Burns, I cannot thank you enough. This has uh, been a complete joy. For more uh, serious jibber jabbers, others in the series, go to teamcoco.com slash serious. Thank you so much. This is great. This is fun. <laughs>